we had reached uh, the 40th, we have done 39 verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, from today on, we'll talk about the passage starting from verse 40 onwards. Uh, the passage starting from verse 40 is a passage which is a long passage. Uh, it's it goes until verse 141. So something like 100 plus verses. These verses, this big longish passage is addressing the children of Israel. Surah Al-Baqarah, the longest surah of the Quran, is divided into two broad groups, two broad passages. The first one is addressing the children of Israel, the Jews in particular. And the second passage is addressing the children of Ismail, the Muslims. And before the beginning of the first of the two passages, there were these verses that the Almighty uh, mentioned as a prelude to these two important discussions. So now, the first of the two passages begins. A'udhu shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahim Ya bani Israel az guru ni'mati allati anamtu alaykum Children of Israel, recall my blessings I shard upon you. Wa'ufu bi'ahdi ufi bi'ahdikum wa'iyya ya farhabun and fulfill my promise, I will fulfill your promise. And fear me alone. So, one of the things uh, this verse is saying is, O oh, children of Israel. Now, the children of Israel uh, are the people who were the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham. Ibrahim alayhi salam had two sons. Well, he had more than two sons, but two of them became prominent. Ismail was the elder and Ishaq was the younger. Ishaq alayhi salam uh, had a son, Yaqub, Jacob. Jacob's other name was Israel. Yaqub had 12 sons. They came about to be described as Banu Israel or Bani Israel, the children of Israel. So this nation multiplied, proliferated, and they were called children of Israel. The Almighty himself describes them as children of Israel. So the Almighty, after having uh, described, having narrated the uh, story of uh, Adam and Iblis, wherein the theme of, could, could this be removed, uh, this hand? Uh, after having described, uh, described the, the story of um, Adam and Iblis, wherein uh, the theme of the story was that Iblis refused to uh, to bow down before Adam, refused to follow the Almighty's uh, instructions because he was arrogant, because he thought that he was superior to Adam. Uh, and as a consequence, he was rejected by the Almighty. Um, this happened... And then the Almighty mentions that uh, Iblis became the enemy of Adam and, and Eve. Uh, now the Almighty is inviting the children of Israel to accept the message of the Quran, the message brought by Muhammad, who was the uh, 
who belonged to the children of Ismail. Now, the children of Israel, they were uh, um, arrogant. They thought they were superior to children of Ismail. And therefore, it became difficult for them to accept the Almighty's expectation that they should believe in the lost messenger, even though they knew that he was from God. So, you know, the sequence of these verses is significant. After the story of Adam and Iblis, now the Almighty is inviting the children of Israel to believe in the Quran and the lost messenger and is telling them that if they are not going to believe in him because of their false sense of uh, superiority, then it would actually mean uh, that it would actually mean that they are also arrogant. And they should know what arrogance did to Iblis. So, says, recall my blessings I shard upon you. Say, oh, children of Israel, remember, recall my blessings. Uh, the blessings to the children of Israel were the blessing of them being chosen and raised to the status of a family, of a nation, who were picked by the Almighty to be his representatives, representatives of his message before humankind, all humanity. The Quran tells us in Surah number 3, Surah al Ibran, that after Ibrahim a.s., the Almighty decided that instead of sending individual prophets, he would pick a nation. And the nation, the family that he picked was the family of Ibrahim. Now, this family of Ibrahim is comprised of two branches. The children of Israel was given the first chance. They were the first to get this opportunity. For 2,000 years, they remained the Almighty's representatives in this world. And, uh, you know, they were accompanying blessings. They got the support of the Almighty. They were the ones who, whenever there be a need, they would get divine help. If they would do wrong, they would be punished. But if they do, would, they would do well and they would need the Almighty's support, they'll get it. So the Almighty is reminding them that those Kuru Neymati, Remember, recall uh, the blessings. Anamtu alaykum, I showered upon you. Baufu and uh, fulfill my promise. That is, you promised me that you will continue to remain loyal to the Almighty's uh, messages. You will remain uh, loyal to the Sharia, to the law that was that was given to you, you will follow it properly and you will accept all prophets who will come later. Not only would you believe in them, you would inform others about it as well. That's the promise that you made to me and I got it confirmed, renewed over and over again. If you good, if you will do it now, Aufu Biyahdi, I will fulfill your promise. That is, I will continue to shower upon you my blessings. I will continue to take you as uh, people who enjoy uh, my approval will be will be considered as chosen people, noble people, eligible for uh, success in this life and the next life. And fear me alone. That is, don't fear the Lord loss of status that might happen as a consequence of you believing in this last message. You know, the children of Israel, the Jews were the uh, were considered to be the religious elite, and uh, people would come to them to get guidance. So they feared that if they are going to accept this new prophet from 
the children of Ismail, that they will lose that status. Don't fear that. The Almighty says, fear me alone. And also, do not fear the reactions of the fellow children of Israel. You know, when you are living in a community, uh, there are many people who tell you that don't go against the norms of our group or else you'll be doomed. You know, there's this peer pressure. There are people who will tell you, don't tell the truth. Because in that case, uh, you'll be ostracized. You'll remain isolated. You'll, you'll not be able to get the help of your, your, your family members, your tribesmen, etc. Et so the Almighty says, don't fear any of this, uh, these threats. Uh, but fear me alone. Verse 41. The Almighty says that, and believe in what I have revealed. Confirming what is there with you. And uh, do not be the very first disbelievers of it. Don't be the first who have rejected it. And do not compromise on my verses for petty considerations. And fear me alone. So the verse says that believe in what I have revealed. That is, believe in the Quran and believe in the Prophet who has brought the Quran. So the Quran is now directly inviting the children of Israel to become Muslims, to believe this is the truth that has now been revealed by the Almighty. Uh, and this truth is the one which the Quran says, believe in what? What I have revealed and it confirms what you already have. That is, you already know through your books and the prophecies that are there that this book and the prophet who has brought this book, they are from God. Your earlier prophets, your earlier books that you read, you recite, they have confirmed that another prophet would come. You read those prophecies and we are inviting you to accept the messenger, the, the prophet, who has come as a consequence of those prophecies. And as a result, he has confirmed what's already there in your books. That's what the invitation of the Quran to the people of the book is. We've just got to tell them that, look here, you're not going to accept anything new or strange. It's a part of your tradition. It's a part of your commitment, the commitment that was made by your own elders. I think a part of good invitation, Dawa, is that we make the task of others easier. When we start hurling at them arguments after arguments in a very strong, confident, kind of insulting way, we are actually paving the way for the barriers to be erected. And it's very difficult then to accept a message, even if it's correct. So the Quran is actually telling them that, look here, believe in what I have revealed, confirming what's already with you. And do not be the very first disbelievers of it. That is, instead of being the very first believers, what a shame it would be that you would, you would become the very first disbelievers. As I said earlier, in my earlier presentation, that a person becomes kafir when he rejects the truth that he knows is true from God but doesn't want to believe it. These people of the book who were there present at the time when the Quran was being revealed, they knew 
that it is the truth from God. But they didn't want to believe it. So the Almighty is saying that if you will not believe it, if you will not accept it, then you will be the very first kafirs, the first to reject the message of the Almighty, knowing it to be from Him. And then says, Wala tashtaru biayati thamanam kalila. And do not compromise on my verses for petty considerations. You know, why, why would you reject this message? Probably because you think that if you're going to accept it, your status as the chosen people is going to be compromised. What a petty consideration. I mean, is this what you really value more? That's unfortunately the case with many religious groups because they have become so strongly emotionally attached to a group. They become biased. And truth is not their problem. That's not, not what they're seeking. They are seeking the truth that suits them. They are looking for the truth that belongs to their group, their sect, their religion. The Almighty says, don't sell my verses. Don't compromise on my verses for very petty considerations. These are no considerations. There, was, there should be only one consideration for a truly religious person. And that is to know the truth. You know, the Quran says, we'll see in Surah Al-Baqarah, telling these people of the book, Sibhat Allah, acquire the color of the Almighty. The color of the Almighty means that you have only one consideration. I want to satisfy and please my God, no matter what. So you've got to break these shackles, these boundaries, and do not compromise uh, on my verses. And fear me alone. Do not fear neither the loss of status nor uh, the uh, consequences uh, which some people are threatening you to face. You will face if you will believe. Just do the job and accept the truth that has come to you. And do not mix truth with untruth. Nor hide, conceal the truth. Even though you know it. Don't do it knowingly. That is, the Almighty is uh, asking the children of Israel in general and the scholars in particular, he's telling them that, look here, don't mix truth with untruth. It so happens quite often that uh, because religious people, they are presenting religion. So when you are presenting religion, you are actually in many ways, in many cases, telling the truth. I mean, God's message is the truth. But unfortunately, there are, there are some religious people who, while presenting the truth, they also mix untruth in it as well. And one way of doing it is by hiding the truth. The end result is that it becomes so very difficult for the common man to distinguish right from wrong. Because he thinks that, you know, this man is a noble man. He's a pious person. He's talking about he's talking about the Quran. He's talking about Sunnah. He's talking about Hadith. He's talking about prayers. He's talking about Zakat. And uh, he appears to be a religious person. So, he ought to be saying only what, what is truth. And if because of a person's status as a religious guy, teacher, if he starts presenting some message, some part of the message which is untrue, it's a big, big crime. That is what the Quran is asking 
the scholars of the children of Israel in particular to stay away from. Do not mix truth with untruth. And don't hide the truth. You see, as I said earlier, one way of mixing uh, untruth with truth is that you hide the truth. So you are presenting some part of the truth most impressively, passionately, but you are hiding some truth which should be disclosed to people, but you're not doing it. So that is what always got to be avoided. I mean, it's not that uh, a person who is entrusted with the task of delivering God's message, he should deliver 95% of the message. 5% of it he should He's allowed to hide. But that's going to be a huge crime. It would actually cause the rest of the effort to be completely spoiled. It will be uh, nullified. So don't do that. Quantum Talamun, the Quran says you know it. That is, don't do it knowingly. Honestly, a crime becomes a crime in the eyes of God only when it is done knowingly. Um, it's a simple fact. And unfortunately, not many people acknowledge it. So as I said, we blame non-Muslims for being non-Muslims, even though we don't even know whether they know the truth or not. So what the Almighty abhors, hates, is that a person knows what the truth is and yet he doesn't accept it. So that is what makes an individual uh, unacceptable in the eyes of the Almighty. The Quran goes on to say, and say your prayers regularly, and pay zakat, and bow down along with these people who are bowing down. Now, Quran is, in other words, inviting these Jews, the children of Israel, to become Muslims. Because if you become a Muslim, you're actually doing two things. You're saying your prayers and you're paying zakat. Somehow it has become very well known amongst Muslims that a person becomes Muslim when he recites the kalama. When the Quran says you become a Muslim, then you start saying your prayers regularly and you start paying your zakat regularly. So the Quran is inviting the Jews, the children of Israel, to become Muslims. And uh, this invitation is extended by asking them to start saying their prayers and to start paying zakat. Something they were already aware of. Salat and zakat are not, not new concepts introduced by the last message. These are the two pillar practices of religion right from day one. All prophets have presented the same salat and the same zakat, obviously with minor differences. And therefore, the Jews are being invited to do what they already knew was a part of, an important part of God's religion. And because this aspect of religion was most prominently highlighted by the companions of the messenger, and it was actually happening right in front of their eyes, the Almighty is inviting them to join them, inviting the children of Israel to join them. It says, and you bow down along with these people who are bowing down. They're already saying their prayers. Look at the way they're bowing down. They're doing their ruku, ruku doing their sujood. Join them. It's the same message. It's the continuity of what you have already been given. So join this, this practice and be a part among part of those people whom if you will join, the Almighty is going to be pleased with you. Uh, it is said that the Jews had abandoned, well, they had abandoned prayers in general as well as zakat, but in particular, even if they would worship, they would not do ruku. So in particular, they have been asked to do ruku for uh, this purpose as well. Do you ask people 
will be to do good. But then so na hanfu sako. And you forget yourselves. Bantum tatlun al kitab. Even though you recite the book. Afala taakilu. Don't you understand? Don't you realize? This the particular passage most certainly has to do with the scholars of the children of Israel. Who would deliver sermons who would ask people to become good humans, good believers, who would tell them to say the truth and do not sign with what is untruth. And this would be a part of their uh, regular exercise of teaching others God's religion. And honestly, it's a, it's, a pro it's a problem, it's a challenge which uh, people who deliver God's message, they have to face. You know, it's a part of their profession that they have got to say good things. But it's, it's another matter whether they themselves practice what they preach. And really is a huge challenge, I can tell you. Uh, because while saying things good is not a difficult task, doing it is, is a challenge. And uh, quite often you come across, you know, you're faced with a situation that you're telling others to do certain good things or to avoid certain evil things. And you realize that what you are urging others to do or not to do yourselves are, you yourself are doing it or, or not doing it. Well, you are doing what you are asking others not to do and you are not doing what you are asking others to do. So it really has to be a process of, a regular process of self-correction, self-criticism that one must go through in order to remain on the right track. And uh, if you become a habitual speaker on religion, oh my God, then you're gone. Because uh, and there would be hardly any way for you to be able to reform yourself. And this actually happens uh, when you become a part of a certain religious group. Your vested interests are there. Uh, you have people who have become your friends, your colleagues. You probably have your your uh, financial stakes, you know, with them. You're being paid by them and so on. So uh, quite often it becomes difficult for people who are telling others to do good things to be following the same principles themselves. So here the Quran is actually asking these people, are you telling others to do good and uh, forgetting, ignoring your own selves? even though you recite the book. Now, re reciting the book, this mention is important. Because even if at times you uh, ignore yourself while uh, talking about good things, uh, the book of the Almighty would remind you. So that, you know, one of the important things that one must do is to continue to read the book with an open mind and with tadabur, deep, deep reflection. That helps you in realizing that uh, what you are, what you are uh, reciting, is actually applying to you as well, and it's it's inviting you to reform yourself and admonish. It's ad admonishing you. Afalata don't you realize? So, as I said, this is a uh, an invitation to the scholars of the children of Israel in particular, that while they are urging others to do good, to stand by what is true, what is right, you should not forget yourself. And, uh, you know, it, there, there is an incident mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Saad, uh, Surah number 30, Eight, wherein uh, Daud salam is reported to have been uh, saying something to two individuals 
And he was talking about a certain principle that some people who are strong, they try to put pressure on the weaker partners, try to make them submit to them. And they do it unfairly. And while he was talking, he realized that he was being tested by, by the Almighty. And he immediately, spontaneously, he prostrated and sought the Almighty's forgiveness. Because he realized that what he was saying to others is what he himself has not be, been able to live up to, at least in one case. Obviously, he was a great man. He was a prophet of God. We don't know what that incident was. We have no business to know about it. But there's one thing that we know. That is that when you're speaking to others about things good, trying telling others to be good, don't forget yourself. So these were some of the verses as the beginning part of the invitation to the children of Israel for them to believe in the Quran and the last prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and this is invitation is going to continue. And we'll continue to read uh, the subsequent verses in the later uh, later programs, presentations. Uh,